Hello and welcome to Business Standard. I'm Venus Sandhu and we have with us today Dr. Arvind, Professor of Physics and Vice Chancellor of Punjabi University. Uh, Dr. Arvind is part of the elite group that is, uh, you know, helped prepare the National Quantum Mission and the mission aims to take India into, uh, you know, an information superpower, to become an information superpower. Thank you so much, Dr. Arvind, for spending time to speak with us. Yeah, good evening. So, uh, could you tell us a little bit about the National uh, Quantum Mission? What is the plan about? And uh, from what stage has the team been involved? And when did we begin and where are we heading? Yeah, see, quantum technologies are becoming extremely important in 21st century. Uh, the origins of these ideas go back to um, early, uh, late 1980s and then 1990s with this animal work on quantum cryptography, which started in 80s but became important in 1990s, uh, and Shor's algorithm for factorization of numbers, which came up in 1996. Uh, well, these were theoretical ideas, and uh, many people were skeptical that they will never really become real technologies. And that skepticism has now been lifted with these technologies becoming a reality. So I personally have been involved with this area from uh, very early on in, in 1998, 99, I got interested. So I was one of the first people who got interested in this area of quantum information processing or as they call it. Uh, but you see the experimental efforts uh, took much longer time to develop. Uh, I also must say that we kind of did not, as a country, did not take an initiative which uh, we should have taken maybe uh, in the year 2000 or 2001 and so on. So things moved on, but uh, it was in 2019 that uh, Department of Science and Technology Government of India started a coordinated project called QUEST, Quantum Enabled Science and Technology, in which about 300 crores were uh, money was given to you know uh, several projects uh, which were all over the country and they included the uh, yeah, quantum information quantum communication with photons quantum computation with the uh, spins nmr and nv centers superconducting qubits and iron trap qubits and so on so that was the first coordinated project which was funded in uh, 2019 it has these four verticals and the national coordinator for the vertical on um, quantum communication with photons and that has 24 projects spread over all over the country in uh, RRI Bangalore, in IIC, in most of the IITs, in most of the ISERs. So that's how it is. And uh, when the Quest program was started, very soon the importance of quantum technology was realized and uh, Government of India decided to look at Quest and its progress and make it into a much bigger program. And the national mission work started in 19 itself, uh, because Quest was funded in 19, but the work to set up Quest started in 17, actually. So after the Quest started, very soon uh, this uh, uh, group was set up to develop a detailed project report, uh, the on which we call NMQTA, National Mission on Quantum Technologies and Applications. And uh, we did a lot of work in terms of, you know, we organized consultative meetings. Four of them were organized. One was at either Mali, which I organized. One was at Tiruvannapuram, and two were in other parts of the country. So we consulted all the scientists working in this area. And then this detailed project report uh, over a long time, we wrote and we submitted, uh, I think, in 2021, if I remember. So then, of course, the governmental processes took its own time and they had several reviews and several layers and so on. And uh, we're very happy that finally the mission has been launched. And the idea is to develop quantum technologies, which would be like quantum communication devices, quantum computation devices, and uh, quantum sensors and so on. So um, uh, we're expecting that once the mission starts, there will be hubs funding will be available, there will be industry collaborations. So um, activity at all levels will, will begin. There will be programs, there will be teaching programs, all kinds of things should happen now once the mission uh, is rolled out. Uh, you mentioned uh, quantum communication and you also mentioned quantum computing. Could you explain in very simple terms, like, you know, what, what does this mean? 
Yeah, see, let me begin with quantum communication. Uh, we all are interested in secure communication, whether you send your bank password through a message from your phone or when the uh, defense forces are trying to give, get, give instructions. We would like nobody on the way to be able to listen to our conversation, and that's what's called secure communication. Now, secure communication achieved through something called cryptography. So we encrypt the signal in a way that nobody else can make out. So it turns out that all earlier ways of uh, encrypting can be broken if we have quantum computers. So they are not fundamentally secure. So quantum communication is a completely secure quantum encoding process in which information is encoded using a certain quantum method, which we call quantum cryptography. And it's in principle uh, completely secure. So it's not just the practical difficulty that nobody can read it. It is not readable in principle. And if anybody tries to read, the person will be detected. So it's a final answer to secure communication problem. That is what is quantum communication. Now, quantum computation, uh, see, some problems are uh, easy and some problems are hard in, to solve on computers. For example, multiplication is easy, but factorization is difficult. Now, if you want to search an unstructured database, it is very difficult. For example, if, if you give me um, a name, of course, uh, I can give you the phone number. On the other hand, if you give, if you take the your name directory, which has several volumes, I mean, earlier days, I mean, when landline numbers were there, and you give me a number and you ask me whose number is this, that's a very difficult process. So such problems are, uh, which are very difficult, uh, you classify the most difficult problems are exponentially hard. So you can show that very soon, no computer will be able to solve that problem if you make the size of the problem bigger. So quantum computers are new kind of computers which are based on the uh, on quantum ideas, which will be able to solve the problems which are not solvable on regular computers. So one of them is, for example, factorization, which then leads to a lot of other solutions and so on. Then, of course, quantum simulations and other things and so on. The third component is quantum sensors, that uh, the sensing capability of quantum devices is uh, far more than the regular devices. So uh, you could, uh, you know, pick up signals from single atoms, single molecules, and so on. So, um, for example, gravitational waves, very, very fine signals which are around, which we need to measure. Uh, it's expected that it will be quantum devices which would be uh, used to measure them. So it will have end-use applications. I mean, for, for people like you and me, like, you know, in case... Will it eventually have end use applications where we could use it on our phones or we could use it really people could yes, use it? On yes, phones? yes, yes, uh, particularly the quantum secure communication. Uh, I think uh, eventually all secure communication, whether it is passwords or it is uh, uh, security of forces related information, will is all going to have a quantum layer. So this will be um, uh, the final, final communication will be through a quantum channel. So the entire thing that we are facing now, you know, banks of every now and then, then banks are sending out messages, uh, financial, uh, you know, institutes are sending out messages that, you know, do not like, there's so much of cyber fraud. Is it, is then, uh, quantum, are quantum technologies then an answer to all these uh, worries? Yes, to some extent, yes. I mean, that is the next level of uh, security, which is the quantum security. And that is going to be qualitatively one level higher than the current security available with the communication protocols. Also, what are the areas in which quantum technologies could give us an edge? For instance, is there healthcare, uh, healthcare agriculture, space science? Uh, well, well, at the moment, uh, quantum communication is immediately needed for security purposes because if everyone else is going to have quantum encryption, then India cannot really not have quantum encryption. And these are the things which nobody would sell you. So you will have to kind of develop them, them indigenously. That is one. Uh, in quantum computing, uh, of course, there, there are going to be advantages. But to build a very large working quantum computer in India is going to take time. But the quantum sensors and uh, other quantum-enabled technologies will definitely have uh, applications. 
And then a lot is opening up in terms of, you know, coming up with new ideas to build quantum computers, new kinds of information processes, startups are coming on. So since quantum industry is going to develop all over the world, uh, it's important to be, be, a, be a, have a partnership with that industry. So uh, the mission also talks about certain predetermined milestones that, you know, it aims yeah. to achieve over the next uh, eight years from starting yes. from now to 2030-31. Yes. What yes. are these milestones that we are looking at? Well, these are, uh, I mean, exact numbers are there in the uh, reports and DPR. But for example, uh, up to what distance can you set up a quantum communication device? So there are lab-based devices which can communicate up to a few meters. But you need hundreds of kilometers. Can you do quantum communication in a large city or across cities? Then satellite-based communication, where there will be a satellite which will be uh, mediating the quantum communication, which then can be done over much larger distances. I mean, a signal goes from Delhi to the satellite, from satellite it goes to Tevanpuram, and then you set up a quantum channel uh, in, in over different parts of the country. Then the basic units of quantum information are qubits, like your bits in computers. A qubit is a two-level quantum system. So you have one qubit, two qubit. Mm, eventually, why one would need thousands of qubits, hundreds of qubits to do reasonable quantum computing. And currently in this country, uh, the even very advanced labs, I mean, I work with the NMR group, we have four qubits. In KFR, they have uh, superconducting qubits. I think they are working on three qubits. So this number will have to be taken up. So we should have, you know, 100 qubit quantum computer or 200 qubit quantum computer. So those are the kind of things one would build uh, in the coming years. So that um, we are also players in the in the game and not only doing the toy models. Uh, you know, there's a lot of debate also going on about artificial intelligence, its benefits and also concerns around artificial intelligence. Yeah. Can quantum technologies still artificial intelligence in a useful, beneficial... So that's a very, very interesting question. You see, artificial intelligence, the way we see it today, neural networks and machine learning, uh, these techniques or these ideas came up in 1950s and 1960s and so on. So this is, by the way, not very new. Just that we did not have big enough computers to implement those ideas. And that is happening now. Now, uh, people are already talking about quantum neural networks, quantum machine learning. So quantum versions of uh, artificial intelligence, algorithms like the neural networks and machine learning are already being researched upon. And that would again uh, be, give it a new dimension to, to even the artificial intelligence programs when the quantum layer is brought into them. So one is looking uh, to a quantum revolution of that field also, where you uh, generalize the neural network models to quantum neural network models, machine learning to quantum machine learning, and so on. Already a lot of research is happening in those areas. Uh, what are the other countries that are working on quantum technologies, and where are they at vis-a-vis -vis India? Well, uh, I think the uh, like there is a European mission, of course, the so United States is, has put in a lot of efforts into it. There's an Australian program, there's a Chinese program. So I would say these are the major players in the game. Uh, China did a very fundamental thing of showing the satellite-based quantum communication. They have a whole, uh, a big developed program around it. In quantum computing, uh, the IBM and Google have set up uh, the prototype quantum computers, uh, which were set up a few a couple of years ago, I and mean, more than that, maybe three, four years ago, they have brought in the next versions now. So a lot of uh, development has happened in the United States about it. Uh, Europe has a lot of research going on, and Australia also has a big program. So these are the players. Uh, since you asked the international status, let me tell you that uh, in the year 2000, when we started our little research in IIC Bangalore and some other people in Calcutta started working on these ideas. China had not even set up a program. So they set up a, but, but they saw the, the policy makers and government saw its importance much earlier than ours. I mean, we were ahead of them in terms of uh, scientific curiosity, interest, and initial work that happened in this country. But uh, we delayed our mission quite a lot. I mean, by, I would say by 20 years. The mission could ideally come up in the 
first uh, 10 years of uh, 21st century. But well, it's, uh, it's better late than never. So uh, now that the mission has been set up and you were talking about, you know, there would also be hubs, various hubs where they, uh, it would be like, you know, and you also talked about, uh, spoke about, you know, uh, there will be part of the exercise would be teaching. What does that mean, part of the exercise? Well, that means that we see if we are setting up a um, 600 crore mission in which we want to build these technologies, we will need a lot of manpower, a lot of human power, a lot of people who will be able to execute these things. They will need to be trained. So one would be training programs, one might even have, you know, uh, master programs in uh, quantum technologies. And those are the kind of teaching program. One may have to organize large schools, uh, school I mean, uh, where you teach the basic subject and uh, we have to induce the next generation to take it up because such a large mission requires uh, a large amount of training, the manpower, which will carry forward the mission. So that, therefore, the first part of the mission should be to train these people and build these institutions and labs and so on. Because currently, the number of people working in quantum technologies, well, I know most of them, but would be about 100, 150 in the country. So 150 people scattered over the country cannot really, really build a 600 crore mission to deliver quantum technologies. So we have to scale up. So that scaling up means uh, human resource development in the area. So how far away would be from, say, one of the first milestones that we have set out of those eight years? Well, some of the uh, early milestones are already set up. So many of the, for example, in quantum communication, many groups have shown the prototype crypto systems. So we are very hopeful that uh, within even three years, we will have uh, working prototypes for crypto systems. Computing will take a little more time. And uh, as things unfold, one would see how it how how that part grows. But some of the milestones will be. I mean, uh, in DPR, we also say some of these low hanging fruits. So those should happen between two to three years. Would would security be one of those? Yes, the the first kind of goals that would be achieved in the mission would be a thing related to secure quantum communication, which is very much needed for the security needs of the country. The benefits you've like talked about, are there limitations? Limitations or also concerns? I mean, uh... well, one of the limitations, if you really ask me now that you're asking about limitations is that, uh, say, taking a leadership role in the area of development of technologies is not easy for a country like ours, uh, which have not really earlier uh, taken such a role. I mean, if you look at the regular computers, uh, not much development of these computers have happened in this country. So we are primarily users of these technologies. And when you want to develop new technologies, when you want to develop new things, you need a lot of ecosystem, as they call it, people who make small things, people who help you with your R&D. So that ambience and ecosystem it does not exist to the level it exists in more developed countries. So therefore, it is not going to be so easy to, to move forward with this mission because you want to set up a lab, you need something where to get it. Many of the things will be coming from abroad. Then we'll have to maybe set up allied industry who would build some of these things. So these are some of the difficulties. Second thing, as I already mentioned, that we are a little late. So therefore, but then late also is an advantage and a disadvantage. The disadvantage of this is it, but advantage is that many things that people tried out and they failed, we know what can work and what cannot work. So the progress also could be faster. So we won't have to reinvent the wheel yeah. in that sense. Anything else that you know is significant that I might have missed asking you? Well, I would also like to say that the 2022 Nobel Prize in Physics uh, went to uh, three individuals, Aaron Aspe, then uh, Anton Zellinger, and uh, Clauser. And these are the people who did experiments to demonstrate the um, violation of Bell's inequalities in quantum physics, uh, which is a feature which sets uh, quantum mechanics very apart from the earlier ways of thinking about the world at a very philosophical and conceptual level. 
Now, that comes in and plays a very important role in quantum technologies and quantum information processing. So, um, the, the lesson is that these quantum technologies hinge upon certain very non-trivial and non-intuitive aspects of uh, quantum mechanics. For example, in the classical world, I can be only in one place at a given time. But in the quantum world, a quantum particle can occupy two different places at the same time. So, similarly, a classical world, you read a book and you put it back in a shelf. Then I go and read that book, it is the same book. But in the quantum world, every time you read or take information out, it changes the system. So next time somebody goes back and looks at it, which means if it's a quantum library and a quantum book, somebody goes and uh, tries to read the book. If somebody has read it early, the book will be different. Now these features, which are very non-intuitive and very philosophical, actually play an important role in the development of quantum technologies. So it's extremely fascinating area. So younger people should think about um, making career choices towards quantum technology. Almost like a, you know, like a sci-fi. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Arvin, for spending time to speak. With yeah, thank you. And uh, I hope whatever we talk will be useful. It, it is. It is very interesting. Thank you so much. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.